Vocal Eye Almost Live Zoom. The Dark is Rising, Part 1. Hosted by Amy Amanti, with special guest Eileen Barrett. Welcome to this Vocal Eye Almost Live event. My name is Amy Amanti. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Associate Director here at Vocal Eye. I'm your host for these Almost Live events, and I'm a member of the blind community. I want to uh, always, as I do every week, send out love and thank yous to all of those who have supported Vocal Eye, uh, who have made donations, who have sent in wonderful testimonials. Keep those coming. If you have capacity to make a financial contribution, there's always a link in the chat or on our website or on our emails um, and on our, our newsletter. So there's lots of ways of following us. But if you happen to be watching this particular episode on our YouTube channel, we really, really hope that you like take a time to take that little mouse cursor or click your keyboard over to like and subscribe. That would really help us out. Vocalize broadcasting to you all from the traditional and stolen lands of the Coast Salish peoples, in particular the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Now, tonight's almost live event is uh, an audio adventure, we'll call it. It explores this boy's fight against ancient evil. And so I thought to myself, okay, I want to know a little bit more about some of the monsters and, and uh, evildoers in some of the Indigenous folklore. So um, I did a little uh, little searching around to see what I could find. You'd be surprised. I found more than 100 different stories. So I combed through a bunch of them and of course came across one that I thought might be uh, maybe known to some folks, which is this, the story of the Ogopoga. So, or some people say Ogopogo, but in, in legend, it's Ogopoga, which translates as water demon. And according to folklore, lives in the Okanagan Lake in British Columbia. Most commonly described as measuring between 40 to 50 feet in length, this sea serpent resembles the extinct Massasaurus, which was a, a carnivorous aquatic lizard from the Cretaceous period. And according to the legend of the First Nations people, the, Oka, the, Ogopoga, <laughs> the Ogopoga would demand a toll from travelers in exchange for safe passage. Because as travelers were passing on the lake, they would pass near the Ogopoga's home, which is Rattlesnake Island on the lake. And using uh, his tail to create a mighty storm, that's what he would do if you didn't pay the toll. And uh, as a result of the mighty storm, the ships and the bodies of the people would be strewn towards the uh, towards the mainland. And so people would see that sort of as a result of not paying the, the toll to cross the river. So that's the legend of the Ogopogo. Um, the Ogopogo today is often seen as um, the spirit of the lake. If you are kind to it, it will be kind to you. So we pay respects and Indigenous folks pay respects to the spirit of the lake. So no, no longer do people bring chickens and small animals in their boats when they're crossing and drown them as an offering to the Ogopogo. It's all about respect for the caretakers of the land, respect for the caretakers of the water, and giving respect to that means that Ogopogo will let you pass. So I thought that was an interesting legend and or folklore and as we um, explore tomorrow night or part two next week of this uh, The Dark is Rising series, um, I might share with you a, one that's a tad more sinister and grotesque in folklore. So stay tuned for that. Okay, welcome. It's Wednesday. March 29th, 2023, and tonight we're proud to offer you our almost live event number 115, 115. It's called The Dark is Rising, and this is part one of this BBC series uh, from BBC and Theater Complicité. Welcome Eileen Barrett into the space, who is going to be, um, uh, you know, sharing a little bit of, like Eileen does best, sharing a little something, something with us about uh, about the, uh, the series. <laughs> Where we start, I keep calling it a series, even though we're playing it in two parts. It's like 12 episodes long, but Rick, our um, magician, has stitched them together to us for us so that we don't have to listen to, you know, all of the welcome and credits for each episode, which is nice. So, yeah, I but mean, it, is, it is serialized, Amy. It's so you're serialized. Right here. Thank you so much for what every day is a school day. I loved hearing about the Ogopoga, which of course we I was gonna say is a sister to the Loch Ness monster, but well it, it's a similar legend. There's another one too that's got a similar legend and now the name is escaping me. 
Um, but there's a couple of other sea serpents that mm -hmm. uh, are in folklore that uh, haunt and kill people for, <laughs> for passing by the, a good the lake. Yeah. Well, I think Nessie's very shy. She doesn't like to pop up unless, you know, it, 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 unless you can get away quickly, apparently. But anyway, why do I know? I'm not a sea serpent expert, as you know, but yeah, that would be a fun career. <laughs> but you are, but you are a theater expert. And, uh, I don't know. About that and is. you are, you are somebody who goes on fact finding missions to get interesting <laughs> information. I'm just so thrilled that we get to listen to this one because it is, uh, it's beautifully produced and uh, bi binaurally, yeah, if you if you do get the chance to listen to some of it, even if it's not all of it, uh, with headphones on, it really, really, the depth of field that you get yeah. really feels like I, a couple of times when I was listening to it, I was turning around thinking, was I hearing that in my room or am I hearing it? And he's like, no, it's, it's actually, it's, it's, uh, it's the way they've recorded it. And, and there's, they, there's been uh, like huge leaps and bounds in sound design and sound quality. I wonder, do you think the pandemic had anything to do with that? I think people were, cause the, the, the pod, the, the uh, rate of podcast, cause this is a podcast, yes. uh, which essentially it really is an audio book. It's just that in the Ooh. podcast world, they divided it into like short 20 minute kind of episodes, right? Mm -hmm. And probably released them one week at a time kind of thing. They, so, they certainly did yeah. because, and it was very seasonal as well too. So they started it uh, midwinter Eve and they worked all the way up purposely because yeah. the story takes place around that time of year. So they had the very first one was uh, released at the winter solstice yeah. uh, on purpose because it's it's significant in the, in the story as well too. So that was the first episode and it led all the way up through to- and I I think that, you know, I, I, I don't have, this is only anic my anecdotal feelings about the pandemic and how, you know, people may have been experimenting with sound and different things and, and some really great uh, art in terms of podcasting stories and audiobooks and things like that were, were like, they upped their game a little bit. I, feel, feel I think, like. yeah, I, I definitely, definitely think so. Uh, and they, these, the, these adapters, they actually had four creative principles that they okay. were working on they wanted to honor this novel because it's 50 years old and they wanted to honor this 50 year what did they call it? the 50 year long power of its enchantment uh -huh. they wanted to make something much more ambitious than just uh a, and a reading of the book yeah uh they, they it was so important to them that the supernatural elements of the production would be recorded binaurally to immerse the listener acoustically and number four that they wanted to draw out the transnational nature of the author's vision uh the old ones who we're going to hear a lot about you know very very soon they're the sort of heroes uh, uh the, the warriors of light they are drawn from every country and every background and they were really really specific in that and it's a jamaican old one who gives uh, Will, our central character, an object of immense power without which his quest could not be completed. Uh huh. <laughs> so, and they've and they've also broadcast it to ninety different countries. Ninety, really? It all in the English language or in different languages? Do you know? Uh, this, I think, th th this version with uh, different forms of translation available, okay. like like yeah. But yeah, so no, it no, it's this version. That's an immense amount of work. It's an immense amount of work. Yeah. 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 But I guess, like you said, you know, with, <laughs> with the pandemic, people had some time. They right. had some time and great resources because that I've, I've seen the setup for how they recorded it because there is a little blurb about the making of. And it's very cool because uh, for anybody who's done, you know, studio work, you're kind of you're stuck in one place, usually with a microphone that you're speaking very close to. But these microphones are there. If you can imagine the north, south, east and west poles. So there's four like four of them so that you get uh, you get the, the poles of sound. And then the uh, the artists are either in a circle around them or within that that sphere so that the uh the the mics are picking it up on either side by orally binaurally okay um, you get a huge depth of field that way right right instead of them just speaking directly in the microphone it's yeah. maybe catching stuff from somebody across the room yeah or or you know or moving in time 
Mm -hmm. Or instead of like a wall of sound, you get, you know, a little bit over here. And, and there's a lot of, it's it's so cool because there's a lot of, uh, they also said that as, as speaking and singing things out loud are so important to the story because that's what invokes a lot of the magic and a lot of the power. Mm -hmm. So to be able to pick up on those little like, you know, whisper back here and a little snatch a song over here, um, it really, really is an immersive experience. Um, like if you don't have headphones, apparently if you sit right in front of your uh, your speakers, you can get yourself right in the sweet spot. Apparently, you can get a similar kind of uh, quality. Good to know. But you know, I, but the earphones are the way to go. Yeah, I've listened to this a couple of times. Uh, yeah, and so uh, I did listen to it with my earphones in, and and certainly noticed a, a really interesting sound design. Yeah. Um, when I listen to it without my headphones, I'm not going to say that I. I, I I didn't necessarily notice sort of that surround sound thing, but the sound quality is still really nice. It's not like it's, 3D, it's not like if you can imagine a three D movie where if you wear the glasses, you can see something three D, but if you don't wear the glasses, it's all kind of fuzzy, right? It's not it's not it's, like that. The audio is still nice and clean and crisp, so I don't want people to panic if they don't have a set of headphones nearby. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's it's fantastic. They yeah they've got there's so much care in this production. It's 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 really beautiful. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I know that this production has some of your favorite actors in it, Eileen. It sure um, does. And it. It, may I just mention, well, okay, yeah. okay. So Simon McBurney, who is, we're going to hear a lot of his beautiful velvety voice. He's yes. the narrator. He is a co-adapter of the, I mean, this is a passion project for him. So he co-adapted it. He's a co-founder of uh, Complicité, which is one of the two production companies that are involved in it. He also directed all of the episodes wow. and he plays a narrator. And uh, you know, he's not using the same voice for this, but he was also Creature, the misunderstood nasty house elf in all the Harry Potter franchise movies. And then Toby Jones, who plays uh, Walker slash Hawkin, because a lot of them have, you know, two different manifestations, usually the same person, but two different timelines. Uh, he played Dobby the house elf. Dobby, I remember Dobby. Dobby the house elf. I mean, Toby Jones, I'm sure when you hear his voice, you'll go, oh, that guy, because he's in everything these days. Yeah. And then uh, Dame Harriet Walter, who has a voice like cut glass. Um, she plays the lady. And she's uh, Dame, uh, Dame Harriet these days is quite famous uh, for her stage production, she's taken on Hamlet. She's taken on Richard the Third. Like played those parts. She's taken on Prospero and the Tempest. So parts that were traditionally male roles, she has taken them on full bore. Um, so she's yeah, she's wonderful. And her her yeah, she's a, a wonderful actor. And then uh, Paul Reese, who's another, he's a, a Welsh actor, uh, plays Merriman. And yeah, yeah. And then we have 13 year old Noah Alexander. I mean, what a, can you imagine if you're 13 yeah. years old and you get to be in this and you get to be the main character? Uh, he plays uh, Will Stanton. So he's out there in, in the video of how, when they were making it, he was, you know, they're running around on the set, which they have the, the, the whole studio is all padded with, they've just thrown down like old towels and things like that, but just so that they can get the noise of exertion and all that kind of stuff. So you really, they're not having to stand there and just act yeah. like they're running. They're actually running and yeah. jumping and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. But how cool would that be when you're a kid? I know it sounds like a lot of fun, and I think that um, I didn't didn't know that part until you told me about how how the sound design had worked. That um, you can actually hear that. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense because a part of me was like, these guys are great voiceover actors. Like, how do you learn to do that? Okay, yeah. there's, there's some tricks. There's some there's some some hand holding. There's some help. And they are they are great actors as well too. The technique that they have is unbelievable. And but but and it's like it's a, like a massive ensemble as well too because the main character comes from a, a, a massive family. He's the seventh son of a seventh son. So there's all these brothers and sisters wow. and mom and dad and they're all very musical. And so there's all that as well too. And so yeah, so music figures very prominently and yeah. So they had to be quite multi-talented and he's got a beautiful little voice as well too because they sing in harmony and yeah yeah there's a, a lot of really cool things in this first part and next week is the second part um eileen we're, we're just about ready to hit play is there anything you want to do to set this up any, oh, yeah. any okay one up? thing any content warnings what, what do just want? one just one thing that might not be clear to people from north america 
who might not know what a rook is, or, or I may be, a rook is a member of the Corvid family, like the crows, and they're really, really important characters, but they're, that's what a rook is. I mean, it's kind of like, you'll, you'll get that, but it's, yeah, just so you know what they're talking about when they talk about the rooks. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm excited, my friend. I know you're going to come back and join us afterwards, and we can talk through the first, uh, first half of it, and big thanks to Rick for making this kind of seamlessly stitched together for us. Uh, when you're ready, Rick, go ahead and hit play on The Dark is Rising. The Dark is Rising by Susan Cooper. A drama from BBC World Service. Episode 1, Midwinter Eve. Will pressed his face to the window pane. The snow lay thin and apologetic over the world. The straggling trees of the orchard were still dark, the white squares on the roofs of the garage, the old barn, the rabbit hutches, the chicken coops. Further back, he could see the flat fields of Dawson's farm, dimly white striped. All the broad sky was grey, full of snow that refused to fall. No colour anywhere. Four days to Christmas. I wish it would snow properly. Will looked away. The gift he wanted most this Christmas was something nobody could give him. Snow, beautiful, deep, blanketing snow, and it never came. At least this year there was the grey sprinkle. That was better than nothing. Oh, I haven't fed the rabbits yet. Hey, James, want to come feed the rabbits with me? Said his brother. They ran down the stairs and clumped out through the sprawling kitchen. Rabbits! Shouted their mother. I know, Mum, we're already going. Will shouted, shutting the door behind them. Outdoors was suddenly very quiet. Opening the cage to feed the rabbits, Will paused, frowning. Normally they would rush forward, twitch nose to eat, but today they leapt back in alarm as he opened their hutches. Hey, James, what's the matter with them? They seem terrified of me. Dear Will, happy 11th birthday and happy Christmas from Kingston, Jamaica. Here I am sending you a single present for both, which I know I always promised never to do, but let me tell you why. I was in the oldest part of Kingston one day during carnival. Anyway, I got mixed up in a procession when an old man, white hair, deep eyes, appeared out of nowhere, pulled me aside and said, You are Stephen Stanton. Her Majesty's Navy, I have something for you. Not for you, but for your youngest brother, the seventh son. It will be a gift from you, his brother, and he will know what to do with it in due course, although you will not. All I could say was, but who are you, and how do you know me? He looked at me again and said, I would know you anywhere. You are Will Stanton's brother. There is a look we old ones have, and our families have something of it too. I don't know what he meant by old ones, but, um, well, here I am sending it to you, what he gave me. I don't know whether you will understand, especially after you see what the present is, but perhaps you will. You've always been a bit different from everyone else. Love, Stephen. When the dark comes rising, six, six shall, shall turn, turn it back. Three from the circle, three from the track. Wood, bronze, iron, water, fire, stone. Five will return, and one go alone. Tugging the handcart, Will and his brother James made their way down the overgrown drive of their house and along the road to Dawson's farm to fetch the hay their mother had asked for. Will glanced up at the treetops and he saw the sky dark with wheeling birds. Oh, 
Whoa! Listen to those rooks, James. Something's disturbed them. Come on, Will, let's pick up the pace. It'll be getting dark soon. But why are they making a fuss? They ought to be roosting by now. Oh, come on, let's go. But as Will's head turned, he jumped and <gasps> clutched his brother's arm. What's up? There's someone over there in the shadows looking at us. Or oh, there was. Just someone out for a walk. So what? No, it was a weird-looking man, all hunched over. When he saw me looking, he ran off behind a tree. He scuttled like a beetle. It's just a tramp, Will. But it Come feels on. like such a weird day. First my rabbits were all scared of me, then the rooks, and now this tramp is spying on us. Pull yourself together. Come on, let's get that hay for Mum. I want my tea. The handcart bumped through the frozen ruts into Dawson's yard. Oh, smell that. The cowshed must have been mucked out today. Ooh. Afternoon, John. Hey. The cattleman, John Smith, was grooming the great shire horse Polly by the stables. He raised his hand in greeting, looking at the two boys with steady eyes. Nothing, Miss John. Ah, well... James? Farmer Dawson came out of a barn. Hey, uh, hay for your mother's rabbits and chickens, you want? Yes, please, Mr Dawson. John, fetch the lads some hay. Thank you, Mr Dawson. The farmer glanced up at the sky. Two black rooks were slowly circling, and Will saw a strange look come over his lined brown face. The rooks are making an awful din today. And Will saw a tramp up by the wood. What was he like? Ah, just a little old man. He dodged away. So the walker is abroad. Ah, he would be. Nasty weather for walking. Look at that. Oh, yeah, more snow coming. The clouds of the farmhouse roof were massing, growing ominously darker. It's a horrible day. It's weird somehow. There's John with the hay. Come on, Will. You go, James. I I want Will to pick up something for your mother from the house. John! But as James pushed the handcart off towards the barn, Farmer Dawson didn't move. He remained where he was and looked up again at the darkening sky. The walker is abroad. This night will be bad, and tomorrow will be beyond imagining. And then he looked down at Will, and Will looked back in growing alarm. Tomorrow will be beyond imagining? What can he mean? You have a birthday coming, Will. Yes, tomorrow. Mm. I have something for you. The farmer glanced briefly round the yard and then withdrew one hand from his pocket and gave Will an ornament made of black iron, a flat circle quartered by two crossed lines. What is it? For the moment, just call it something to keep. Keep with you always, all the time. Now put it in your pocket now. That's it. And later on, out of sight of others... Loop your belt through it and wear it like an extra buckle. Thank you very much, Mr Dawson. Farmer Dawson looked at Will in the same intent, unnerving way. Keep it safe, Will. The less you happen to talk about it, the better. You'll need it after the snow comes. Will felt the hair rise on the back of his neck. Come on now. Mrs Dawson has a jar of her mince meat for your mother. But Mrs Dawson was not there. Instead, waiting in the doorway was Maggie Barnes, one of the farmhands. Round-faced, red-cheeked, she always reminded Will of an apple. Here's your mince meat, Mr Dawson. Mrs Dawson said you'd be wanting it for young Will here. She went down to the village to see the vicar for something. Oh, thank you, Maggie. All yours, Will. How's your big brother, Max, then, Will? (laughs) Oh, uh, fine, thank you. Growing his hair long. (laughs) Long hair, get away with you. And then Will noticed her gaze slip upwards past his head and out of the corner of his eye. He thought he saw a flicker of movement by the farmyard gate. No, no one's there. Get a grip, Will. Right, Will. Let's be getting back. Bye, Maggie. Bye, James. Bye, Will. But as the boys were leaving the yard, suddenly the farm dog racer appeared out of nowhere. Furious. Razor! James! Oh, oh come on, boy, you won't hurt you. Razor! Let's go! James, something's wrong. Razor, he's never been scared of me before. 
Something's awful. Let's go. The daylight was beginning to die. Dark birds thronged over the treetops, even more agitated than before. And there he was. James! Oh. The stranger in the lane, standing beside the churchyard. I told you there was someone watching us. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. A shambling, tattered figure, more like a bundle of old clothes than a man. He turned his shaggy head to look at the boys, and then, suddenly, rushing down out of the sky, two huge rooks swept at him. And then three more whirling black shapes after the first two, diving wildly at him, again and again. He's running! What was that? Rooks, they don't do that sort of thing. They don't attack people. They just don't. No. Dazed, Will felt his cheek brush against something, and putting his hand to his shoulder, he found a long black feather there. And he suddenly became aware that someone was trying to tell him something. Something I can't understand, like a kind of silent shout. That, that was quite a thing, wasn't it? When the rooks came out from the sky. Oh, no. <laughs> well, what a thing. I suppose the tramp must have been trying to catch a rook and it got wild. Oh, well. On we go. James is forgetting. He's forgetting it. The attack. How are you feeling about your birthday? Do you want to know I got you? It's running out of his mind you. like water. As if something is wiping it from his memory. Something or someone doesn't want him to remember what has just happened. Hello, everyone. Come on, chop chop. That table is not going to lay itself. Oh, it's where that radio was. Why is it doing that? I can't hear myself. Please, Will! Turn it off! Will sat quietly at tea. His fingers closed round the iron circle in his pocket and held it tightly. This time, the iron felt warm. He kept his mouth full to avoid having to talk. Not that his talk would be missed in the cheerful babble of the Stanton family, especially given he was its youngest member and the ninth of nine children. Now, what do we have for tea tomorrow, Will? Oh, liver and bacon, please. Oh, oh. oh <laughs> shut up, the rest of you. It's Will's 11th birthday. He can shoot. Say, please, please, Will, tell us you don't really want to have liver and bacon. <laughs> oh, shut <laughs> up, James. <laughs> Let him have what he wants. He needs what he wants. Sorry, I'm late, man. Oh, I had to walk from the common. Wow, you should <laughs> see it out there. Like a blizzard. What? Don't you all know it's snowing? Oh, free or snowball? Heavy? Oh, I'll say here. Oh, wow, look at this. Covered. Shut the door. Shut the door. Later that evening, as Will climbed the stairs to his room at the top of the house, he could think of nothing except what he hoped he might see in the morning. Snow everywhere. He opened the bedroom curtain and pressed his nose against the cold window pane, gazing out into the dark. Still snowing. Heavier, if anything. As Will slipped into his bed, he reached over into his trouser pocket on the chair beside him and took out the strange iron ornament that Farmer Dawson had given him. He ran his fingers around the circle and along the inner cross that quartered it. It was freezing now. Such an odd kind of iron. No shine, but no rust either, and so cold to touch. Loop your belt through it, out of sight of others. After the snow comes, you'll need it, you'll need it, you'll need it. And it was then, without warning, that the fear came. The first wave caught him as he scrambled out of bed. It halted him stock still in the middle of the room. I can't move the rooks. And then the image of the attack was gone and he was released. Nothing's wrong. Everything will be 
All right. If only I can stop thinking and go to sleep. It'll be your birthday when you wake up. Oh, frightened of the dark. How pathetic. Look, there's the bookcase and the table. Everything's ordinary. Just go to sleep. Will still tossed uneasily. The feeling was growing worse every minute, as if some huge weight was pushing at his mind, trying to take him over. And then into his mind came a dreadful darkness, a sense of looking into a great black pit. And the fear jumped at him again, like a great animal that had been waiting to spring. I can't move again. I, I'm going mad. I'm going mad. mad. <laughs> You all right? You're huddled in a ball. What was that crash? The skylight in the ceiling was hanging open, swaying. A black square of empty night in the roof. And on the carpet below the skylight, a heap of snow. Well, I suppose the snow was too heavy for it. Did it wake you? Lord, what a horrible shock. Yes. Yes. It was a shock. Well, I tell you what, Will, it's freezing up here. Why don't you go down to our room and sleep in my bed, hmm? Okay. Right, then. Thanks. Come on. Will bundled up his discarded clothes, picked up the belt and its new iron ornament. He smiled at Paul, but still he felt... I can't stay here. I just can't. I feel as though something is attacking me. I just don't know who or what. Because he had noticed something that Paul had not. Buried in the heap of snow on the attic room floor, Will had seen the fresh black wing feather of a rook. This night will be bad, and tomorrow will be beyond imagining. Episode 2, Midwinter Day. When the dark comes rising, six Six shall shall turn turn it back. When the dark comes rising, six shall turn it back. Three Three from the circle. Three from the circle. Three from the trap. Wood, bronze, and iron. Water, fire, and stone. Five will return. And one go alone. The dark is rising. I will tell you only this, Will Stanton. You are bound to devote yourself to the long conflict between the light and the dark. You are one of the old ones, the first to have been born for 500 years. Will Stanton was woken by music. Music of such deep enchantment that he woke smiling in pure happiness at the sound. In the moment of waking it began to fade and then, as he opened his eyes, it was gone. The room was still. There was no music. But Will knew it was no dream. Cold light glimmered round the edge of the curtains but no one was stirring anywhere. He pulled on his rumpled clothes from the day before, crossed the landing to the central window, and looked down. Snow! Oh, so much snow! Wow! All the outbuildings surrounding the family house were mounded into glistening square towers of white. And beyond them was the familiar landscape of fields and hedges. There was Dawson's farm buried to the horizon's brim. Will Stanton. Where's that coming from? Welcome, Will. Who are you? He swung round. 
nothing. But when Will turned back to the window, he saw that his own world had vanished. Everything had changed. The snow was there as it had been a moment before, but now there were no outbuildings, no roofs, no fields, no roads, no buildings of any sort, only trees. Trees, trees everywhere. Will was looking out over a great white forest. Where's everything gone? A forest of massive trees, and the only break in the white world of branches was away to the south, the River Thames, like a single black ribbon in this vast snowy ocean of forest. Robin! Hey, Robin! Wake up, Polish! I. I. Robin! Robin? James! Wake up, James! You have to see this! James! Everyone! Wake up, everyone! Wake up! Silence. No answer. The house and everyone in it lay in a sleep that would not be broken. Oh, I need to get out of here. Got to get out. Oh, my jacket. Where is it? Um. Oh, yeah, the sheepskin one. Uh, my boots. OK. Oh, I need to get out of here. Oh, I've never seen so much snow. As Will moved away from the house, he suddenly felt very much alone. It's much too quiet. There are no birds. No bird singing. He made himself go on wading through the snow without looking back, because he knew that if he did look back, he would find his house had vanished. Will just accepted everything that came into his mind, without thought or question, as if he was moving through a dream. But at the same time, he knew. I'm not dreaming. I'm wide awake. Yes. He was wide awake in a midwinter day that had been waiting for him since the day he had been born, and for centuries before that. As he trudged through the snow, he could feel that something or someone was driving him on. I've got to get to Huntercombe Lane. Wait, this is Huntercombe Lane. But where's the village gone? There are only three houses here, and they're made of stone. At the sound of banging, Will's hand instinctively moved to the buckle on his belt that Farmer Dawson had given him the day before. Now it was very cold. Great showers of sparks were spraying out from where a man, a smith, worked on an anvil outside one of the houses. A huge black horse, midnight in colour, stood by the smith. Will had never seen such a horse. No markings anywhere. The man raised his head and looked at him. It's John Smith from Dawson's Farm. Morning, John. Hey, Will. You're out early. It's my birthday. So it is. So it is. Happy birthday, young Will. John Smith looked at Will, but there was a warning in his eyes. And a figure moved out of the shadows behind that horse. Will's breath came faster. A hollowness was in his throat. He didn't know why. The man was tall, wore a dark cloak. His hair was reddish. And as he patted the horse, he suddenly turned and stared, stared at Will with bright blue eyes. A midwinter birthday. And you will be 11 years grown. Yes. Yes, that's right. The cloaked figure glided forward. Oh, you're hungry, Will Stanton. As he dropped his arms, the morning darkened and an extra layer of cloud swallowed the sun. Bring your birthday fast with me. Mind yourself, young Will. John Smith swung a horseshoe into a bucket of water and the rider moved back. The day grows, Smith. How much longer? Your iron will not be hurried. Get on, get on. There. He's done now. 
The red-haired man at once moved his black horse round, tightened the girth and slid upwards into the saddle. Come up, boy. I'll take you where you want to go. The folds of his dark robes flowed over the flanks of the black horse. Riding is the only way in snow as thick as this. The rider looked like a statue carved out of night. No, thank you. I'm out to find the walker. So that's it. I must find the walker. The rider twitched the horse's head, leaned down and grabbed at Will's arm. Now the rider is a brawl. You will come with me, Will Stanton. No, he won't. But with astonishing speed, John Smith leapt forward and dragged Will out of reach. <laughs> that was a foolish move, my friend Smith. We shall not forget. Oh, thank you, John. I hope... They can do me no harm. I am a blacksmith. I belong to the road, you see. On the road through Hunter's Coombe, their power can do no harm. Remember that. Don't leave the road. John, all I know is I must find the walker. But I don't know why. Will you tell me? Ah, no, young girl. That you must learn for yourself. <sighs> John Smith turned and looked down at him for the first time, and compassion crossed his weathered face. And you'll learn much more, for this is only your first day. My first day? So follow your nose through the day, boy. Just follow your nose. Suddenly, a white mare, without rider or harness, trotted into the clearing towards them. A reverse image of the rider's midnight black stallion, and she came to stand quietly beside Will. Good mare, good mare. Come in good time. Look well, young Will. I've not seen a horse like this ever before, but this will not be the last time. Oh, she's beautiful. Mount. Bitch. I'm not joking. It's your privilege. Take hold of her mane where you can reach it, and you will see. So Will reached up into her mane and... <sighs> but how did I get up here? I... When I have shot her, she will even carry you, if you ask. John, no. I think... I think I'm supposed to go alone. <sighs> Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Go well, young Will. Remember, Will, follow your nose. Stick to the path. From the edge of the trees, Will glanced back. John Smith had one of the mare's hind feet clenched between his knees and was fitting a shoe to it. That's not a normal horseshoe. It's a circle courted by a cross. Again, instinctively, Will put a hand inside his jacket and touched the iron sign threaded onto his belt. It was very cold now, and he was beginning to know what that meant. After the snow comes... You need it. Will trudged on, passing a narrow side lane, and then something made him glance down the track. And there, some way away, in the doorway of a low square hut, stood the shambling old tramp of the day before. The, the walker. So the walker is a broad. Ah, he would be. And it was at that moment that Will left the safety of Hunter Coombe Lane. So the walker is a broad. Only me. What's it to you? I want you to tell me some things. I want to know why you were hanging around yesterday, watching, why the rooks came after you. I want to know what it means that you are the walker. You can't be the one. I can't be what? You can't. You ought to know all this, especially about those hellish birds. You're trying to trick a poor old man, eh? You're out with a rider, aren't you? You're his boy, eh? Of course not. I, I don't know what you mean. But you might be the one. You might. If you're carrying the first sign that the old one gave you. Have you got it there, then? Show the old walker the sign. <laughs> 
as Will pushed the sheepskin aside to show the quartered circle looped on his belt, his hand brushed against the smooth iron, and now it was burning, biting with icy cold. It's for our bodies to leave the road where we'll stand. Will turned, and the rider and the black horse edged forward. He shrank back against the side of the hut, staring into the blue star eyes of the man in the cloak. I must show the sign. So, you have one of them already. Well, one will not help you, young Will. Not at all. Not yet. The rider hunched his shoulders strangely, his horse tossed its head, and then the two of them began to grow, dark and vast against the snow, the stallion rearing triumphantly, lashing the air so that Will was forced back against the wall. Horse and rider towered over him like a dark cloud, blotting out both snow and sun. But then the rearing shape suddenly fell away to one side, swept away by a blazing golden light, brilliant with fierce patterns of white hot circles, suns, stars. The white mare from the smithy. Will reached up, grabbed frantically at the white horse's waving mane, and again found himself jerked upwards onto the broad back, bent low over the mare's neck, clutching for his life. Ride. Ride on to Coombe Lane. And the great horse leapt for the trap through the trees, passing the shapeless black cloud that hung motionless in the clearing of smoke, galloping, the world flashing by in a pale blur, wind wrenching Will's collar. But then huge grey thunderheads blocked out that sun, and behind, swooping towards them, a shape darker than even the clouds was suddenly above them. One patch of blue left in the sky. There. Closing, closing, leap for it. Over his shoulder, Will saw the rider, towering, immense, his eyes two dreadful points of blue-white fire. No! The white horse leapt, leapt desperately at the closing gap. Yes! And they were through, free, safe. Blue sky. Sun. Oh. How? And now Will and the horse were galloping above the curving slopes of the Chiltern Hills, capped with great trees, beech, oak and ash. And on one hill, as Will looked down, he saw a vast mark cut through turf into the chalk beneath the soil. It would have been hard to make it out if it had not been familiar, but he now knew it well. A circle quartered by a cross. And then... Suddenly, Will's hands were jerked away from their tight clutch on the thick mane. And he was falling, falling. And yet, he knew no shock of a fall, only that he was lying face down on cold snow. Where am I? Where's the white horse? Come through to us, Will. We have been waiting for you. As he stood before Will on the snow-clad hill, standing alone and tall on the slope, leading to nowhere, were two great carved wooden doors. Episode 3, The Sign Seeker Come through to us, Will. We have been waiting for you. In the snowy landscape on the wind-swept hillside, Will stood, staring up at the carved panels of the two great closed doors towering before him. By instinct, Will placed his palms flat against the wood, and the doors swung open beneath his hands. Whoa! The world Will Stanton had inhabited since he was born seemed to whirl and break and come down again in a pattern that was not the same as before. He peered ahead into the darkness, and all at once sparks leapt and fire flared. Oh! Oh, wow! Lighting up an enormous fireplace in the far wall, and he realized he stood in a great hall. What is this place? And on either side of this enormous fireplace... 
two figures were waiting for him. An old lady leaning on a stick. Welcome, Will. And a tall man. Come in, Will Stanton. Will looked at the man and saw deep-set eyes, an arched nose, fierce as a hawk's beak, and a sweep of wiry white hair. Come in. And learn. As he approached the fireplace, he saw the old lady was small, fragile as a bird, and Will had an impression of immense age. Who are you? The lady. She's very old. In her time, she's had many, many names. But it's best for now if you go on thinking of me as the lady. Yes, ma'am. Expect nothing and fear nothing, here or anywhere. There's your first lesson. My name is Merriman Lyon, and I greet you, Will Stanton. The tall man bent lit a long taper at the fire, came forward and began to put the taper to a ring of candles there. We have been waiting for you for a long time. Although he did not know why, Will felt compelled to stare at the fierce, secret lines of that face. You look like someone I know. Do I know you? In a sense. You see, you and I are similar, Will. Now look at me. Here's your first exercise. We have before us Will Stanton. Tell us what's been happening to him the last day or two. Well, um... Uh, yesterday, the animals were all scared of me. Yes. And the rooks were mad. Farmer Dawson gave me a sign of iron. Something to keep. The circle with the cross. Keep with you always. Then the walker came oh, after me. Walker. And then the rider tried to get me. They want the sign. I don't even know what time I'm in or who they are, except for the rider and the walker. I don't know you either. I only know you are against them. Against the dark. Yes. You and Mr. Dawson and John Wayland Smith and... Uh, Go on, Will. Wayland? That's an odd name. What made me say that? Minds hold more than they know. Particularly yours. The rider. When the rider saw the sign, he said... <sighs> you have wanted them already. He didn't know why I had it. But he came after me, chasing me. Why? It isn't the sign they want most of all. It's you. Why? I will tell you this, Will Stanton. That you are one of the old ones. The first to have been born for 500 years and the last. Merriman stood there tall as a tree in the shadowed room, and Will could not take his eyes from him. Your birth, Will, completed a circle that has been growing for 4,000 years in every oldest part of this land. The circle of the old ones. Will felt a tightening of his skin and a chill ran through his body. The powers of the dark are reaching out now, steadily and stealthily, all over this world. A shadowy awareness of evil was now pricking at his fingertips and the top of his spine. And your task is to make the circle indestructible, Will. You must find and guard the six great signs of the light made over the centuries by the Old Ones. And only when the circle is complete will they be joined in power. For you are the sign seeker, Will Stanton. The first sign hangs on your belt already, but to find the rest will not be easy. You were born with a gift and a purpose. And you are here now, Will, to begin to understand what that purpose is. But first you must be taught about the gift. I don't understand. I don't have any gift. Really, I haven't. Listen now. The gift is a power that I will show you. It is the power of the old ones, who are as old as this land and older even than that. You were born to inherit it, Will, when you came to the end of your tenth year. And now, on the day of your birth, it is free, flowing, fully grown. 
There's a circle of candle flames beside you there on the table. Yes? In your mind, choose one of those flames. Think of it without even looking. Think of it. And if you tell it with your mind to go out, then that flame will go out. Do it. Now. A sudden thick silence enveloped the room like velvet, and desperation rose in Will's throat as he saw them watching him. I can't do this. I just can't. I know. I'll fail. I'll think of the big fire in the fireplace itself. There's no way that can be put out except by some tremendous magic that I can't possibly have. Go out, fire. Stop burning. Go out. And the fire went out. But h- how did I do Look that? Look at me, Will Stanton. The man's deep eyes burned like black candle flames, but there was compassion in them. It's a little cold, Will. Might you warm us back up? Come back, fire. Burn again. Thank you, Will. The gift is a burden, Will. For For the the dark. dark. The The dark dark is is rising. rising. The The walker walker is abroad and the rider is riding. They have woken. For the dark. The dark is is rising. rising. The dark is rising. That was what Will had felt last night, and that was what he could sense again now. The dark, the evil, surging and surrounding them in this great hall. We are besieged, as you see. They're holding the great door shut from beyond. Will, is that you? Come and help me. Will, come and help me. That's my mum. Mum? Why are you here? Coach, something terrible has happened. The pain! I'm coming, Mum. But look, you mustn't move. We all ran to the door, but in his haste he stumbled and knocked against one of the great candlesticks, and a sudden searing pain shot through his forearm. And on the other side of his arm he could now see the burn. It was the shape of a circle, quartered by a cross. Dark hopes to gain a hold over you while you're not yet grown into your full power. And this is only the beginning of the peril, Will. Through all this midwinter season, their power will be waxing, not losing its high force until Twelfth Night. Right now, we must free you from the circle of dark power that they've drawn around this room. We must open the doors and escape together. Now, Will, listen to me. You must be on your guard against anything. They have failed with one emotion. They will try to trap you through another now. But it must not be fear. Remember that, Will. Never fear them. Never fear them. The powers of the dark can do many things, but they cannot destroy those of the light. Not unless they gain a final dominion over the whole earth. Faster and angrier came the sound, and as Will listened, his skin crept and grew damp. Now, stand by the circle, the circle of light. Stand with your back to the table. Come on, take our hands. Speak the spell together, for it is a joining they cannot break. When the dark comes rising, six six shall turn turn it back. back. Three from the circle, three from the trap. Fill your mind with the flame, Will. Fill it. Together, we can do more than you can ever imagine. See the fire growing like a tree and strike with it. The fire lashed out, hit the doors, and they began to open, revealing the way to escape. But then, in the distance, the silence and the dark, suddenly a pale figure appeared. They've got me, Will! Can't you hear? They've got my mother. Please, I have to go! Don't go, Will. That is not your mother. It's the dark. I have to help her. Oh, God, no! No, Will, stop. But it was too late. Will broke the circle, ran to the doors, which slammed shut, and the dark shrieked in triumph beyond them. Will stood alone, giddy, 
holding his head a strange ringing thrumming in his ears. He saw Merriman seizing the doors, shaking them with the strength of both arms. The doors did not move, and Will felt a force dragging him down. I can't open the doors! But in his state of trance, Will's mind suddenly became aware of a strange music, and he knew instantly it came from the lady. She was speaking to him. He looked back, dazzled. She was taller, brighter. A figure on an altogether larger scale, glowing with a haze that he knew came from a vast inner power. Madam, madam, no. Oh, please take care. The tall, glowing form that was and yet was not the old lady moved forward in the darkness towards the great doors. silence and the air was cold and as Will watched, her luminous figure faded away like smoke that grows thinner and thinner until it cannot be seen at all. The lady's gone, Merriman. Will felt a desperate loss. The dark has taken her and it's my fault. Stop this, Will. What's happened to her? The lady is beyond their power. She's gone away for a time, that is all. The dark could not destroy her. But it has drained her, has left her like a shell. Now quickly, Will, we must move. Thanks to her, we are safe. Now we can pass through the doors once more. Come, come, come! And once the doors had closed behind them, they vanished. And Will found himself back crunching in the snow-drowned landscape into which he had walked from his house early that morning, but a world ago. Merriman? What? It was my fault, wasn't it? Yes. If I hadn't run forward when I saw the doors, if I'd not broken the circle... Yes. But it was their doing, Will, not yours. They seized you through your love and your hope. I've lost the lady. I have lost the lady. Will, I was angry. Forgive me. The force pushing against the doors was the full midwinter power of the dark. But take heart. At the proper time, the lady will return. Merriman pulled the hood of his cloak over his head and led Will on through the deep drifts. Listen, Will. You must understand this. We old ones are planted only loosely within time. Among the great beech trees and oaks bare of leaves, until they paused in a clearing. The great doors are a way through time in any direction we may choose. All times coexist and the future can sometimes affect the past. So do you understand? I think so, but I'm not sure. Well, then where are we now? Uh, hold on. This is Huntercombe Lane. <laughs> my Huntercombe Lane. Hey, and over there's my house. Yes, Will. You are back in your own world, in your own time. And you're in it too? Back again, with mixed feelings. Where will you go? About and round about. I have a place in this present time just as you do. Go home now, Will. The next stage of the quest depends on the walker, and he will find you. When his circle is on your belt beside the first sign, I shall come. Will ran, ran home, up the stairs and onto the landing, crossed to the central window and looked down once more. The ancient magical forest had disappeared. And there again were the familiar outbuildings surrounding the family house, the landscape of fields and hedges, and in the distance... Dawson's farm. Everything was as it was. And as he stood there, he could even hear himself. James! Wake up, James! You have to see this! James! Everyone! Wake up, everyone! Wake up! All right, all right, Will. Don't shout. Bello! Wake up, everyone! Wake up, everyone! Wake up! I mean, it is a holiday, for goodness sake. What? Never mind. 
You could forgive Will for wanting to wake us up early today. After all, he has a good reason. Happy 11th birthday, birthday, Will! Happy birthday! Yay! Mum! Where's Mum? I'm here, Will. Mum! Oh, Mum, you're okay. Of course I'm okay. What's the matter? Oh, uh, nothing, Mum. I think... I, I think I had a terrible dream. Oh. Hey, you need some breakfast. Come on. Episode 4, The Walker on the Way. Will Stanton gazed out of the window of the bus. He had spent most of the afternoon shopping for Christmas presents. It was an annual ritual, the day before Christmas Eve being the day when he was certain of having present money from his birthday. This, however, was the first year he had gone alone. He laid his head against the bus window. More snow to come, they say. As he heard this, Will glanced up at the grey sky. Sixty-six years I lived in the Thames Valley and I never saw it snow like this. Not before Christmas. Never. 1947. That was the year for snow. My word it was. Drifts higher than your head all down Honeycomb Lane. Couldn't even cross the common for two weeks. Herbert, not before Christmas. No, it's January. The lady with the string bag and the man who sat behind her might have gone on like this for the rest of the journey, and perhaps they did, but... Hey there, youngster. Wake up, man. You're going to miss your stuff. OK, coming, coming, coming. Crazy weather. One more winter like this and I'm going back home to Jamaica. Jamaica? My brother Stephen's there. He's in the Navy, docked in Kingston. Is he now? Lucky him. Been Christmas shopping? Uh-huh. Think I've finished it all now. Frozen blood. That's my problem. I need some warm weather to liven me up. The conductor steadied Will as he stepped off. They knew one another well from Will's bus rides to and from school. Merry Christmas, my friend. And stay safe. Be sure to take the shortest way home. Merry Christmas. You'll have some warm weather on Christmas Day. (laughs) You gonna fix it? Perhaps I could. Perhaps I just could. The snow lay deep on the pavement. There had been few people to tread it down as Will set off, grasping his bags and boxes. Pocket knife for Robin, chamois leather for Paul to polish his flute, diary for Mary. As he walked through the snow, he slipped his hand under his coat and touched his sign. It had been warm the last two days, but now it was cold. As he trudged on, he also felt... A small drooping of his spirits, because this year for the first time there had been no birthday present from his oldest brother, Stephen. He always remembers my birthday. He can't have forgotten. Something must have gone wrong. Maybe he's on secret manoeuvres. Will pushed the disappointment away for the hundredth time and felt calmer as he saw the sun blazing out for the first time since his birthday. Wow, look at that. Everything was beautiful again. He plodded on, passing the top of a small track known locally as Tramp's Alley, which he sometimes used, and he stopped and glanced down it. No one's been along there since the snow started, except the birds. Tramp's Alley. Untouched virgin snow. And it was at that moment that he left the safety of Huntercombe Lane and turned down Tramp's Alley. Oh, harder work than I thought. Trees loomed over him, their twigs and branches strewn across the alley, brought down by the weight of snow. All these parcels are really awkward. But out of the sun, it's... Gosh, it's really cold. And then a huge fallen branch lying right across his path, the dead arm of a great elm. 
Oh, this is perfect for firewood. But then a sudden image of the leaping fire that had blazed in the fireplace of the great hall came into his mind. And with easy command now of the gift he knew was in him, he said to this branch softly, Go on, branch. Burn. Ah! Oh! No, no. That was foolish. In panic, he focused his mind once more. Out! Dangerous. Out, fire, now! But this was no ordinary fire, and it wouldn't go out. Oh, why did I do that? Merriman, where are you? And at that moment, someone twisted his arms by the wrists. <gasps> Put out the fire. I, I, I can't. I've tried, but I can't. It was the walker. Walker, let me go! But the grip tightened, and Will's parcels lay scattered in the snow. Oh, no, you don't, boy. I know your tricks. I know now you're an old one. But I don't trust your kind any more than I trust the dark. But I don't want to do anything to you. (laughs) There really are some people who can be trusted, you know? Precious few. You carry the second sign. Give it to me. And he felt the walker's hands fall away from his arms. I have the first sign already, walker. Look! He pulled aside his coat. (sighs) Will saw a face contorted by anguished uncertainty. (sighs) It's so heavy. And I've been carrying it for so long. (sighs) I don't even remember why. Always frightened, always having to run away. If only I could get rid of it, if only I could rest. But I dare risk giving it to the wrong one. Look, you must know I'm not part of the dark. <laughs> Think, Walker, you saw the rider try to strike me down. The old man shook his head miserably. But the things that could happen to me if I did, they can't be put into words. The old ones can be cruel, so cruel. I think you're the right one, boy. But how can I be sure you aren't a trick of the dark? Doesn't the fire tell you? No. No, 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 the fire almost tells. But the fire, it'll bring them, boy. You know that. The rooks will already be guiding them. (laughs) He clutched himself and began rocking like a child. He's a wretched thing, but I have to make him understand. He's got to give me the sign. And those rooks, is he right? Are they really the spies of the dark? Will gripped the iron circle on his belt and stood as straight and tall as he was able. The last of the old ones has come, Walker, and it is time. The moment for giving the sign is now. Now or never. Now, Walker, unless you would carry it forever. Obey the old ones now. Now! The twisted old face relaxed. Yes, yes, yes. The walker fumbled with a broad leather strap across his chest and pulled from it a quartered circle, identical with the one that Will wore on his belt, but gleaming with the dull brown-gold sheen of bronze. And as he put it into Will's hands, the flaming branch burned brighter and went out. It's getting dark. I must go now. And from out of the shadows stepped a figure. Hello, Will Stanton. Oh, 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 Mackie, it's you. You gave me quite a fright. (laughs) Why is that old tramp that's been hanging around? He been bothering you, young Will? I bet he has now. Oh, no. No, I was just coming down from the bus from Slough and I, I, I bumped into him. The walker made to shuffle past Maggie out the track, but... He stopped. He opened his mouth, but no sound came. <laughs> Long time since the last bus from Slough, young Will Stanton. You always take half an hour to do that five-minute walk from the bus stop. A dreadful sense of misgiving began to creep over Will, like the chill of a cold breeze. I don't see that it's any business of yours how long I take about (laughs) anything. Manners. Manners. Goodbye, Maggie. I've got to get home. The trouble with nasty, dirty tramps like this one is that they steal things. And this one stole something belonging to me the other day from the farm, Will. 
An ornament, a goldeny brown kind of ornament, circle shape that I wore in a chain around my neck, and I want it back now. There she stood, the apple-cheeked farm girl who ran the Dawson's milking machine. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I want it back, I do. The mind out of which these words were coming could be nothing but the mind of the dark. And I do think he might. I just slipped it into your pocket when you weren't looking. By the light of that funny little bonfire I saw burning up just now. The hair was prickling upright on the back of his neck. <laughs> Have they stolen Maggie? Or has Maggie always been one of them? And if she has, what else can she do? He stood facing her, one hand sliding cautiously into his pocket for the bronze sign, which was now cold, so cold, and he tried to summon the words. Leave. Leave. By the lady, by the circle, by the signs. These were not the right ones to make her leave. Stay there, we'll stop them. He was caught, immobile, frozen, just like the walker. Maggie Barnes slipped her hand into his coat pocket and drew out the bronze sign. She held it in front of his face. <laughs> then flicked his belt away from him, threaded the bronze circle onto it to stand next to the iron. Hold your trousers up, Will Stanton. Oh dear, now you can't, can you? All his effort and questing was coming to an end before it had even properly begun. <laughs> Look at you, Will Stanton. Oh, Merriman, what did you say? When the walker's circle is on your belt beside the first, I shall come. Fire leapt up again out of the fallen elm branch. Maggie Barnes crouched low on the snow, cringing, her mouth slack with fear. Merriman! And the belt, with the two signs, dropped out of her limp hand. Take her from this road! The blazing circle of light moved, forcing Maggie to stumble with it until it hovered on the rough ground next to the road, and then... it was gone. The great barrier of light sprang up on either side of the track. Go back and tell them that the signs are beyond their touching. Will could see Maggie Barnes groveling wretchedly in the snow now, her arms shielding her eyes from the light. And if you would remain unharmed, do not try again to work your will while you stand on one of our ways. For the old roads are awakened and their power is alive again. The bout, the signs, iron in my left hand, bronze in my right. Will picked up the belt. Remember the two things that saved you, Will Stanton. First, I knew her real name. The only way to disarm one of the creatures of the dark is to call them by their real name. Names that they keep very secret. Then there is the road. Do you know the name of this track? Tramp's Alley. That is not its real name. Well, no. Mum won't ever use it, and we're not supposed to. It's ugly, but I'd feel silly if I called it by its real name. Old what? Old Way Lane. Will stopped suddenly, hearing and tasting the name properly for the first time. But that name has helped to save your life. Old Way Lane. The name tells you what the road is. It was lucky for you that you were standing on one of our old ways, trodden by the old ones for thousands of years, when you played your little game with fire, Will Stanton. I'm sorry. Oh, never, never again do anything with the, the power, unless there is a reason. Will looked up at Merriman. It was my fire that brought the walker to me, wasn't it? And he had the sign. The walker was waiting for you stupid boy, waiting for you to command the sign from him. You did that well, I will say. Poor soul. A hard age 
carrying the second sign. He has one more part in our work before he may have rest. When? Not yet, Will. You will know it when it comes. And now, I must set him free from this spell of the dark. Oh. Go. And now the walker oh. seemed to be fading, growing strangely thinner, so that you could see the trees through his body, and then, all at once, he was gone, like a star blotted out by a cloud. That is the power of the old ways, Will. You will learn that, and the proper names, and much else, very soon. What is your proper name? Merriman Lyon. I told you that when we met. But I think that if that had really been your proper name, as an old one, you would not have told me it. At any rate, not allowed. <laughs> you are learning already, young Will. Come. The day is late. Will trotted beside the striding, cloaked figure clutching all his bags and boxes. They spoke little, and as they came out of the far curve of the track... Will! Where have you been? Look, there's James. Yes. His brother James, walking quickly towards them. I was just coming to meet you off the bus. Mum was getting in a bit of a tiz because our baby boy was late. Oh, for goodness sake. Why were you coming from Tramp Sally anyway? Oh, we, we, we were just, um... Uh... We... we who? Come on, Will. Will turned to introduce Merriman, then stopped so quickly that he bit his tongue, for Merriman was gone. And in the snow where he had been standing a moment before, no mark of any kind was left. As Will looked back, he could see only one line of footprints. His own. When the dark comes rising, six shall turn it back. Three from the circle, three from the trap. Wood, bronze and iron, water, fire and stone. Five will return and one go alone. Episode 5, The Book of Grammary. Christmas Eve. The day when the delight of Christmas really took fire in the Stanton family. Wonderful baking smells permeating the house from the kitchen, the icing of the cake, and for Will Stanton, after breakfast, the great ritual of fetching the tree from Dawson's farm. When no one else was looking... Farmer Dawson slipped a sprig of holly into the top buttonhole of Will's coat. Holly is a good protection against the dark, if pinned over the window or door. And then they carried the tree ceremonially through the front door over the threshold of the Stanton's house. And out of the boxes came the decorations that would turn the life of the family into a festival of twelve nights and days. That evening... Six of the Stanton children, James, Robin, Mary, Barbara, Paul and Will, set out carol singing in the village. The right boots on, please, Carl. Yes. Scarves. And back by 9.30. It was dark by the time they left. Robin carried a lantern on a pole and each of them had a candle in one coat pocket for when they would stand and sing. through the village they sang until at last it was time for Miss Greythorn at the manor the last stop before home there in the doorway of the manor house stood Miss Greythorn's butler smiling politely at them and Will as he looked up at him swallowed his last high note he saw a strong bony head with deep set eyes and an arched nose Fierce as a hawk's beak. Enchanting. What perfect singing. Bring them in, 
Mr Lion. Don't keep them waiting on the doorstep. There she sat in the long entrance hall in the same high back chair they saw every Christmas. Miss Greythorn. Paul, how are your mother and your father? Oh, very well, thank you, Miss Greythorn. And are you having a busy time this year, Will Stanton? I uh, certainly am. Come on, everyone. For Miss Greythorn, good King Wenceslas. Oh, wonderful. Ready? Wonderful. Thank you so much. Unable to walk for years after a riding accident when she was young, thin-faced, bright-eyed, her grey hair swept up in a knot, a figure of total mystery in Huntercombe. Glancing up, Will saw, with a shock as brutal as if someone had thumped him in the stomach... James? James? Robin? Mary? Move! ...that they stood there, immobile, all of Will's brothers and sisters, caught out of time. And as the music drifted into the distance, ahead of Will, emerging out of the dark, rose the great carved doors that he had first seen on a snow-mounded Chiltern hillside. The doors! Yes, Will. We must pass through them again. Merriman raised his left arm, pointed at the doors. They opened, and Will walked with Merriman into the light of a different time and a different Christmas. Now they found themselves in a bright room unlike any Will had ever seen. High-painted ceilings, walls of shiny gold wood and a throng of people dressed like a brilliant scene from a history book. Gas lamps. What time are we in now? 1875. Not a bad year. Queen Victoria has been on the British throne for 38 years and here in Buckinghamshire, Miss Mary Greythorn is holding a Christmas Eve party with carols and music. Yes, ma'am. We've been waiting for you, Will Stanton. Sign seeker. It's almost time. She knelt down beside Will. Now you must find your third sign. The sign of wood. Wood is the sign of learning. And when you've done with your own particular learning, you will find it. Come now. Can we have some more music? Some refreshment for the young man first, perhaps. A small man in a green coat was holding out a glass. Will took it. Oh, uh, thank you. And found himself staring into a thin, lively face, almost triangular, a disturbing face which turned away and looked at Merriman. And, and my lord, might I just... There's no need to call me that in this century, Hawking. Oh. Stop it, my lord. I have had the habit of calling you my lord for centuries now. Who are you? Uh, my name is Hawkin. Nothing more, just Hawkin. Hawkin belongs to me. He's my liege man. He has been with me all his life, as if he were my son. I took him where his parents had died. And no son ever had better care. Merriman put a hand affectionately on his shoulder. He serves me and I hold him in great trust, so great that I have given him a vital part in the quest for your learning, Will. Are you an old one? Nay, just an ordinary mortal man. But like you, Will Stanton, I do not belong to this century. I was brought here only to do one certain thing. And then my Lord Merriman will send me back to my own time when... Hawkin is a child of the 13th century, Will. <laughs> By my art, he has been brought forward out of it for this one day. Before Will had a chance to puzzle over this mysterious exchange, the man in the green coat took his elbow... Come with me, young old one. ...and began to steer Will across the room towards the side door. Uh, don't trust me, do you? Good. Will hesitated, pulling back at the threshold. Don't trust anyone here unless you have to, boy. Merriman? Go on, Will. 
It is all right. Will, Hawkin and Merriman slipped into a small wood-panelled room lined with glass-fronted bookcases and in the corner a vast grandfather clock. Is this where I must seek the sign of wood? No, Will. That part of the quest will come later. Will glanced at Hawkin and saw his thin, confident face tight with apprehension. Merriman walked across the room to the clock and opened the front panel. Guarded in this clock is the book from which you will learn your place as an old one, Will. It is a book of hidden things, of real magic. We call it grammary. And the book is hidden here. Will could see the pendulum swaying slowly, hypnotically, to and fro, to and fro, and behind it, a small leather-bound book. He glanced at Hawkin and saw that he was trembling with terror. Hawkin? <laughs> yes, my lord. Come here. Oh, my lord, please. Come here. <laughs> the time is now. <laughs> no, no. Come on. Come here to me quickly, boy. Kneel. Kneel. Merriman laid his hand on Hawkins' trembling shoulder and reached his right hand into the clock. Shh. Hold still. For this to work, my hand must be on you. He stretched his long fingers along one side, keeping them as flat as possible. Slowly, infinitely carefully, to avoid touching the pendulum, and then, with a snap, he flipped the book out into the room. Catch it, Will! Will raised his hands, and the book flew into them as if coming home. What is it? A book that has been waiting for you for a very long time. Hawkin had collapsed into a crumpled heap. It's Hawkin all right? What's happened to him? He will recover. I had to weave a spell of protection for the book, a spell in two parts. First, the pendulum. I could not touch it or the book would be destroyed. Second, I could only take the book safely out past the pendulum if I were touching Hawking with my other hand. And if you failed? Then the book would be destroyed, and so would Hawking, perished as a mortal man. He risked his life Will! Us. This is a cold battle we are in. And we must sometimes do cold things. Hawking has survived. We have the book. Now read it. Hawking staggered back to his feet, no colour in his face, and leant against the wall, traumatised as Will looked at him with compassion. In this room now, the book will accomplish its final purpose which is to bestow on you, Will Stanton, the last of the old ones, the gift of Grammary. And when you have the knowledge, Will, the circle will be completed and the book will be needed no longer and it will be destroyed. Now we shall leave you here to read, Will, and when you are finished, I will return. Come. Merriman slipped an arm round Hawkins' back and half carried him towards the door, and the two men, one tall, proud, the other crumpled, diminished, made their way back to the music and voices of the next room, leaving Will sitting with the Book of Grammary. Will was never able afterwards to tell how long he spent with the Book of Grammary. It was truly not a book like other books. There were simple enough titles to each page. Of flying. Of the words of power. Of time through the doors. But instead of presenting him with a story or instruction, the book would simply give a snatch of verse or a bright image which somehow sent him into the midst of whatever experience was involved. 
I have journeyed as an eagle. I'm... I'm flying. I'm soaring aloft as if I had wings. No, I am winged. I'm sweeping and gliding. I can rest on the wind. I... I am an eagle. And Will knew, as he flew, that the eagle was one of only five birds who could see the dark, and instantly he knew the other four. I'm flying. I'm flying! Far, far up into the blue-black sky. And I can see the patterns of the stars. There, there, the bull roars by me. Bearing the great sun, Aldebaran. And that's, that's the ply he's singing. Singing to me in small, beautiful voices. Up Will flew and outward through black space. And when he was done, he knew every spell of the sun and moon. He knew the despair of Mercury. He had ridden on a comet's tail. And in a flash, Will was blinking again at the page of the Book of Gramry. And into his mind came the story of the Old Ones. And into Will's mind, whirling him up on a wind blowing through and around the whole of time, was the magic that was the power of rocks and fire, water and living things, so that the first men lived in it and with it as a fish lives in water. And so it went on. And Will learnt the speech of all creatures that have ever been, and the names of all the trees in the world's wild wood. The giant sequoia, the, giant sequoia, the, angel, oak, the angel oak, the ginkgo, the ginkgo and the mountain, and ash, the mountain ash, and on, and on, and on, and on, until at last, Will found that he had come to the end of the book, and that... Facing the cover was... A drawing of the six circled cross signs, all joined into one circle. And that is all. Will closed the book slowly and sat staring at nothing. He felt as though he had lived for a hundred years, and though the astonishing knowledge he had gained should have excited him... He felt so weighed down by it. I guess, young Will, it is a responsibility, a heaviness, isn't it? But there it is. We are old ones, Will, born into the circle and there is no help for it. Come now, give me the book. Merwin, what are you doing? I am about to destroy the book of Grammary, Will. What? so it will not fall into the hands of the dark. I will touch it against the pendulum of the clock that was its protection, and now will destroy it utterly. And then Will was staggering backwards, his hands flying to his eyes. What happened? And when he took his hands from his face, he found he was pressed against the armchair, ten feet from where he had been before. As old ones, the blast could throw us but not destroy us. The book of grammar is gone. Will, we are safe. But Hawkin, where's Hawkin? Is he safe? Oh, he is very much alive, Will. But something desperate is about to happen which involves Hawkin, and I do not know how to prevent it. But come, let us join the party next door. You will see what I mean. And as Will glanced back into the room where the clock had been, there was no damage, no sign of violence or explosion. There was simply nothing. Episode 6, The Opening of the Present Together, Will and Merriman left the small room when in which they had first retrieved and then destroyed the Book of Grammary, the magical book which had taught Will everything about the ancient battle between the light and the dark. 
And when they stepped back into the gathering in the next room, and back into 1875, five will return and one go alone. With a jolt, Will noticed that there, threading his way through the crowd in his dapper green coat, seemingly quite recovered, was Hawkin. <laughs> Look, there's Hawkin. But beside Will, Merriman had stiffened. Merriman? What is it? It is peril, Will. Come through my doing. I have made the worst mistake that an old one can make. And Will saw that lines of pain had deepened on his strong face. Merman, look! <laughs> it's Maggie Barnes, Merman. She's speaking to Hawkin. Yes, the witch girl is here. You should stay close by me for this next while. See, it begins. I want to hear what they're saying. You can, Will. Concentrate now, and by saying, make it so. Will looked again at Hawkin and the girl, and wished to hear them. Listen. And found he could hear them. Truly, madam, I, I have no wish to seem churlish, but I do not dance. <laughs> Why not? Because you're out of your century. They dance in this one with their legs, too. Uh... Who are you? A an old one? <laughs> Not for all the world. Come dance or people will notice. Oh. And as they began to dance, Will looked up at Merriman. I put more trust in a mortal man than he has strength to take. You put your trust in Hawking? As I told you, Will, I could only take the Book of Grammary safely out past the pendulum if I were touching Hawkin, a mortal, with my other hand. That was the spell I made to protect the book. But he loved you, and he was ready to risk his life for you and the light. I know, Will. I know. But he is only a man, and he loves as a man, requiring proof of love in return. In his eyes, I betrayed him. And the result is that here, soon, he will betray me. Will suddenly felt sickened by the approaching treachery. Merriman beside him gazed black into space. You look well for a man escaped from death. He would have let you die, Harkin. No. No, no, no. My, my master loves me. Merriman used you, Hawkin. You are nothing to him. You should surely follow better masters. The dark and the right are a far kinder masters than the light. Oh. <laughs> I need a cold drink, I believe. Follow me. Oh. Come, Hawkin. Oh. <laughs> uh, hmm. uh, uh. So it will go. He will be shown a sweet picture of the dark, and beside it he will feel the demands of the light, which seem bitter and heavy. Oh, Hawkin, my son of centuries, how can you do what you are going to do? Merriman, what will happen because of this? Hawkin will now be a leak in the roof, Will. The dark's ear in our midst, in this house, which has ever been our stronghold. Whenever Hawking calls them now, the dark can attack us here as elsewhere. No. Yes, Will. Our protection here is broken. Will stood dazed, caught in pity and alarm. He did not ask what would happen to the small, bright-eyed Hawking, who had laughed, helped him, and been for so short a while his friend. There is nothing for it. Come. We must rejoin your present time. For there is something, something crucial that you must do there. And the long dresses of 1875, the music, the dancing, Hawkin, Maggie Barnes faded, and Paul, Will's brother, and his flute emerged, as did his brothers and sisters, who were all still singing. Very good, very good indeed. 
Wenceslas has always been my favourite. Now, will you all take a little Christmas punch? Oh, yes. Mr. Lyon. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Miss Greythorn. Uh, perhaps even young Will, too, this year. Happy birthday to you, Will Stanton, seventh son of a seventh son. Thank you, ma'am. So now, Will, Paul, I know you're both very musical, so I wonder, would you like to be shown the old recorders and flutes in the other room? Oh, yes, please, Miss Greythorn. Miss Greythorn. Are the flutes in the library? Miss Greythorn's sharp eyes glittered at Will. The library? There's no library here. Once there was a small one with some valuable books, I believe. Yes, but that burned down one night almost exactly a century ago, when a blast of lightning struck it. I'm sorry to hear that. Yes. There's no arguing with lightning, Will. And sometimes the world has signs for us. Lion, will you take Will and Paul to the music room now? Of course. Thank you. And the rest of you, have some more punch. Merriman led Will and Paul to a side door and into a high, bright room. This is where the flutes are kept. Look at this one, Paul. Miss Greythorn's father was a very musical gentleman and artistic too. He designed this entire room. Paul, absorbed at once, peered into the cabinet at the old flutes and recorders as Merriman handed them out of the cupboard. And as Will turned to study the panels round the fireplace, he suddenly heard Merriman silently calling to him. Well, quickly now. You must look for the sign, the sign of wood. Hawkins' betrayal has cracked open our protection, and the dark could slip in at any moment. But where is it, Merriman? Where's the sign? It is made of rowan wood. Look at the panels, Will. Find the rowan leaf. Find it fast while I stand with Paul. But I don't know what it looks like. Yes, you do, Will. The Book of Grammar taught you. It gave you the knowledge. Think back, old one. Remember. The rowan. The lonely tree. Bright of berry and long of leaf. There. Will. Rushed across the room. That panel. Pressed his thumb into the carving of the roan leaf as if it were a bell push. And suddenly he was staring into a black square hole in the wall exactly on the level of his eyes. Quickly now. He reached in and his fingers closed around a small, smooth object. Merriman, I have it. I have the sign of wood. Good. Will drew his hand back from the gap in the panel, which closed instantly. It's the lion. Yes. Do you think Miss Greythorn would mind if I played a few notes? Not at all. Please. He slid the sign into his pocket, turned, and froze. There were two more figures in the room. Maggie Barnes, and within an arm's length of Will towering over him, unseen by Paul and Merriman. Ah, a sightseeker. The rider. I see I catch you unawares. Hawkin has opened a crack into your sanctuary. Look, your brother Paul is vulnerable too. From the instinct of his new learning, instantly he flung up a wall of resistance around Merriman and Paul and himself, so that both the creatures of the dark swayed backwards from the force of it, and then vanished. Ah! Merriman! Will, what ah! happened? What's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? Um, I, no, no. And who's Merriman? He stumbled, I think, Paul. Banged his funny bone, that's all, on the, on the cabinet over there. It sounded uh, as if someone was murdering you, Will. <laughs> There's no harm done. Now, I will put this precious flute away, and then I think we should all go and give Miss Greythorn one more carol. Yes! yes. Come on, Will. Oh, listen. They're doing First Noel. Oh, quick. and to the earth it was here, and the witch girl. I know, Will. You did well, but careful. They have ways of hearing, remember? Oh, 
Later that evening, as Will climbed the stairs to his room at the top of the house, he could think of nothing but what Christmas morning would bring. And as he pulled the covers over himself, he shivered and gazed up into the close, familiar darkness surrounding him. I have three of the six signs of power now. Iron, bronze and wood. And I have the knowledge of grammary. And then he slept. The time is six minutes past eight. Good morning from the BBC and a Merry Christmas to all our listeners. Later we'll be hearing last night's carols from King's College Chapel, Cambridge. And of course Her Majesty the Queen... Will knelt beside the Christmas tree, excitement thudding in his chest. A long-established tradition in the Stanton family meant that each member could choose to open one present early on Christmas Day. Will gets to go first because he's the youngest. Youth oh. before beauty. <laughs> uh, uh, this one. I want to open this box. No surprise, look at the size Will of it. He made a beeline for a giant box marked with his name, partly because it was so impressively large, but mostly because he suspected oh. it came from his brother Stephen. It's not a box at all, it's, it's a wooden crate. It's from Stephen. We wrapped it on his behalf, took an acre of paper, but we didn't look inside, so come on, Will, come on. The first hard shape of something began to show, a thin, strange, curving shape, smooth and brown like a branch. It was an antler. And then a strong and totally unexpected feeling leapt up in Will, a mixture of excitement, security, delight... A feeling that always came over him whenever he was with one of the old ones. There's a letter tucked behind the antlers. Come on, Will, what is it? Pull it out. Give me a moment, I want to read it. It's from Stephen. Dear Will, happy birthday, happy Christmas, from Kingston, Jamaica. Here I am, sending you a single present Dear for Will, both birthday Dear Will, happy and 11th birthday and happy Christmas from Kingston, Jamaica. Here I am, sending you a single present for both, which I know I always promised never to do, but let me tell you why. I was in the oldest part of Kingston one day during Carnival. Anyway, I got mixed up in a procession when an old man, white hair, deep eyes, appeared out of nowhere, pulled me aside and said, You are Stephen Stanton of Her Majesty's Navy. I have something for you. Not for you. But for your youngest brother, the seventh son, it will be a gift from you, his brother, and he will know what to do with it in due course, although you will not. All I could say was, but who are you, and how do you know me? I would know you anywhere. You are Will Stanton's brother. Well, here I am, sending it to you, what he gave me. I don't know whether you will understand... After you see Will folded the letter and put it back in the envelope. Give it to him. There is a look we all ones have, and our families have something of it too. So, the circle of the old ones stretched all the way round the world. But of course it did. There would be no point otherwise. Will eased the object out of the crate, staggering as he took its weight. What is that? And he is. Or a head, rather. Looks like it's smiling. Will had never seen anything like it. Two branching antlers sprang from a head the shape of a stag's, but the ears beside the horns were those of a dog or wolf. The face beneath the horns was human, with a mouth set in a slight smile, but the feather edged round eyes those feathers. were those of a bird. It's like a bird. Bird eyes. A thing to call out deep responses from the mind. It's frightening! No, it's funny. I don't like it. That's a very odd sort of present. It's a West Indian carnival head. It's old, it's special. Stephen said he found it in Jamaica. Will ran his fingers over the strange face and it took him only a moment to find what he was looking for. Engraved on the forehead, right between the horns... The imprint of a circle, quartered by a cross. It was very much a thing of the old ones. What's it for? For wearing. There's a kind of wire framework that rests on your shoulders. Come on, Will, put it on. Not now. 
Not yet. Uh, no, no, somebody else opened their present. Gwen, uh, you're next. Who on earth can that be so early on Christmas morning? Uh, I'll go. Oh, very good of you. Step in, please. Do, do come in. As he turned back to the living room, Mr Stanton was holding a small package in one hand that had not been there before, and behind him, a tall figure loomed in the doorway. Everyone, this is Mr Maturthin. Maturthin, my sons, um, Max, James, Robin, and um, I don't know where the other boys are, and it's my daughters Gwen, Mary, Barbara, my <laughs> wife Alice. Oh, and, and over by the tree there is our youngest, Will. Will glanced up saw the outline of the face and the longish red-brown hair and froze. How do you do, Mrs. Stanton? Compliments of the season. It was the rider. The dark, the dark is rising. Oh, the dark, the dark is rising. The dark, the dark, the dark is rising. The Dark is Rising, a drama by Susan Cooper. Episode 6 of 12 was adapted for audio by Robert McFarlane and Simon McBurney. Directed by Simon McBurney. Produced by Catherine Bailey and Tim Bell and is a complicité and Catherine Bailey production for BBC World Service and is commissioned by Simon Pitts. The Dark is Rising, part one. That was part one. We'll continue with part two next week. But before we get there, I'm curious. We'll bring Aline back in the space. And Eileen might have some more interesting fun facts, but I'm also just curious what people, uh, how people experience that. I'm so interested to know what your thoughts and experiences were like. So Eileen, welcome back. Hi, Amy. What was your thoughts? What are your experiences? Well, I, I did half and half. I listened to partly with uh, my computer speakers and partly with the um, uh, head headphones back in again. And uh, well, for, I was glad that I had the headphones on for the whispering parts yeah. that was really cool <laughs> Maybe. really cool but also really um evocative of you know when you could when you could hear the uh the old ones whispering all around him just that sense of being surrounded by them I, I love the the way she writes when she talks about uh you know just even the little things about that it's very sensorial isn't it just you know, the sound and the and the the way that it makes him feel when he's in close contact with another one of them and yeah have you got um have you got favorite moments that you are wanting to share with us so far i just any any time toby jones who plays uh the walker slash hawken talks i just mm -hmm. I, I, I i i he's got such a juicy voice it's true. He just, he just rolls around in whatever part he's doing and just pulls out every shred of characterization. I just love it. Like even when he's whimpering on the floor in that horrible scene, you know, when he's just he's lost everything and, you know, thought he was going to die. I just I, I, I yeah, he's just yeah, he's great. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I, I do. I do have to say that sometimes I find um, like, you know, the Harry Potters of the world or some of these sort of fantasy kind of tri time travel things mm. be a little hard to follow sometimes mm. by myself yeah. going, oh, I'm like, so I get really like involved in, for example, the sounds of the whispering and then, mm. I'm like, and then my, mate, my brain goes somewhere and then all of a sudden the conversation goes somewhere. I'm like, oh shoot, I wasn't paying attention. What, I know. What talking about, right? Like I, cause I just get so immersed in it and then I fall out of the story and that's not, it's not anybody's fault. It's just my brain doing what my brain does. Um, but I really enjoyed some of the polarizing sounds, uh, uh, especially at the end where the, where the, where the book gets destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like I was it, watching a movie. The book of grammar. Yeah. yeah. I know. Cause there's something, there's something so, uh, uh, so kind of like, no, about actually destroying a book. Right. Yeah. So you, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's necessary. I, I, I can't help thinking too. I love how the old ones manage to just show up in the nick of time. <laughs> all the yeah. time. 
<laughs> what are kinds of like juicy fun facts have you got for us about this? Series? Well, I was I actually I was making some notes as well too, and thinking, okay, yeah. so he's the first one born in because I mean honestly, this is just my second time listening through to this as well too. So he would uh, okay, just a little fun fact for me. So she published this book in 1973. Mm -hmm. He's 11, um, and I thought, oh, so that means he was born in 1962. So he's the same age as me. <laughs> <laughs> so the last old one who would have been born before him they said 500 years so the last old one would have been born in 1462 or thereabouts yeah and then hawken was from the 1200s because they said the 13th century so they've been around a long time well they don't call them old ones for nothing yeah and i guess uh uh oh, 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 what's his name uh merriman he's the oldest the oldest of the old ones, I, as I gather. Mm -hmm. We've mm -hmm. got the oldest and the youngest are working together. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, anyway, anyway. So yeah, those are the kind of, as you know, Amy, the sort of rabbit holes I fall down all the time and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, so they, uh, with this project, they started it, uh, They the first one aired the 20th of December, which is the eve of both the winter solstice and the 11th birthday of Will in the story. And then they just released them every day leading up to, you know, uh, uh, le leading up to 12th, what they would have called 12th night or New Year. So, um, so yeah, really cool that they had like the 12 days of Christmas all in there, which I, as I gather, they also see the forces of the light and those of the dark are always the strongest at midwinter. Mm -hmm. Always yeah. the strongest at midwinter. Yes. Because I think he said that they are waxing. In other words, yeah. wax meaning getting stronger and waning means waning, getting, getting weaker. Uh huh. Got that. Um, Tilo's got a hand. Let's see what Tilo has to say. Mm. And then Lori after Tilo. Hello. Tilo, we got um, you. I love this series, which you've done, but the <laughs> I've noticed that the music in the background and stuff is very pleasant. And and uh, you're right. It's it's in stereo because I have headphones. I, I had this, and um, I'm looking forward for the uh, for the next one next week. Mm -hmm. The conclusion. The conclusion, yeah. But I I missed a little bit of it because one someone phoned and I had to talk to them. So, but um, is there a possible that this would be? Um, I could watch this later sometime in the future. Yeah, I think we can probably figure out a way of sending that in the follow-up email. I'm sure we can do that. Oh, okay. Yeah. And Tilo, the guy who does the music, he's a, a famous uh, British uh, folk, uh, modern folk singer named Johnny Flynn. He's also a wonderful actor as well, too. He was uh, in the last version of uh, Emma that they did. But he, uh, yeah, he's he, he does the music for all kinds of different series and things as well, too. I could listen to him yeah. sing anything. <laughs> I do remember, I could hear in the voice one of the actors uh, from Harry Potter who played mm -hmm. Dobby. Dobby, yeah. And yeah. Then, then the actor who played Dark Vader on Star Wars could definitely tell his voice. I don't think I'm he's correct James, on. Is James Earl Joe? I don't, I don't think. No, but I think I think somebody with a very similar sound quality, the, quality? One, the one who played the Jamaican yeah, old Maybe that's it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's what it is, but... definitely, definitely similar with that, that really uh, kind of rich sort of uh, um, uh, baritone kind of sound quality. Bar baritone voice, yeah. yeah. Even I can't get voice deep like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly. I used to so... like to listen to Paul Robeson. Have you ever heard Paul Robeson sing? Absolutely. An, an, an incredible activist as well, too. He is famous for you know, being arrested in the United States and conducting a concert at Peace Arch, actually, because he couldn't actually come up. Uh, he wasn't allowed to leave the country. So he said, whatever, let's get some flatbed trucks out. And yeah, famous, famous. Love Paul Rosen. Mm, um, okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Really, thanks is, there, is there anything you don't know? Yes, lots. <laughs> um, it could have fooled me i'm just saying it could have fooled me um, thank you thanks tilo okay we've got laurie's got a hand megan's got a hand amon's got a hand so um laurie you're up next okay thank you for suggesting headphones mm. this performance because there was a lot 
I think I wouldn't have picked up as well without the headphones on. All cool sound effects, hey? Yeah, the sound effects. And normally I don't like stuff like this, but I've been sitting on the edge of my the edge of my seat the whole time <laughs> listening to this. That's not too scary. <laughs> um, I will say these are fantastic uh, actors and actresses in this performance. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really well done, and I'm just I can't wait for next week. <laughs> If only, if only every audio book we experienced was a little bit like this, hey? Yes, yes. And it would have you sit on the edge of your seat and, and really pay attention to what you're listening to, you know? Yeah, yeah. And everything. So I take my hats off to the people who, the lady who wrote this and the way, and the way it was performed. Mm, thanks, Lori. Hi, Amy. It's Christy. I have a question. I can't raise my hand. Okay, Christy, um, I'm going to add you to the speakers list, so I'll call on you in a moment, Okay. Yeah. There's some people that had their hand up before you, so I will call on you in a moment. Okay, so Megan's next, then Amon, then Christy, then Sue. That was awesome. Oh my <laughs> gosh, I loved it. Especially when you had to do a little sign. It kind of reminded me of Wicca, because, you know, mm. they talk about the five elements, earth, air, fire, water, wood, you know, that, that you know, mm-hmm. bronze, and because my mom and I are Wiccans, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Unitarians, and we celebrate the winter winter solstice, and it's so awesome when it almost uh, almost feels like you know, um, it almost reminds me of the it almost remind me of the 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 um the movie The Seeker also this uh, who also which is also who is also a sign seeker, um, has it ever become to a, a, a made in, has it ever been made into a movie or, um. What other books has Susan Cooper actually wrote? Oh, okay. So Megan, she has a whole series. This one is actually the second book in a series of about, I know Ingrid knows this off the top of her head. Oh. I think it's 10 in the whole series. So this is actually the second one. So the character, uh, one of the characters is introduced in the first book and then, um, yeah, so this is the second one. So she, yeah, she actually, uh, she, okay, here's a little interesting piece of trivia about the author. She started out working uh, at, uh, as a journalist, and she worked uh, for Ian Fleming, who wrote the James Bond movie. She was a copy editor for him. And then uh, when she moved to, she moved from Britain to the United States, and then she was able to become a writer full time. So she started working on this series, but uh, yeah, I think there's about 10 in the series altogether. And they all oh, wow. are based in kind of Arthurian and Welsh, Welsh mythology and- um, I love it. For I, I totally Wiccans and we, 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 we celebrate it. Does, does Will actually travel all over the world in these 10 books? Does he actually move to the United States and to Jamaica with his brother and all that stuff? Uh, I'm I, I, I Ingrid would know better. I'm not sure actually what happens in the other books, but I think yeah, the, I, I think that they 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 sort of have the seed of the different characters that they introduce, and then they will move on. Somebody else will be a main character, and so yeah, so they do go to lots of different places. Okay, so, um, Megan, um, Ingrid is going to be with us next week, mm-hmm. um, okay. so you can ask Ingrid. Remember to ask Ingrid all the questions about the books. She's a super okay. fan of this whole super series. Fan. Oh, I'm starting to become a fan right now. I love it. Thank you so much. I'm hooked. <laughs> I'll, definitely, I'll definitely listen to the first series first. I'll definitely listen to the first series first. Thank you so much. Thanks, Megan. Oh, my gosh. Okay. All right. We've got Amin up, and then we've got Christy, and then we've got Sue. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. we can hear you. Welcome. Nice Perfect. to meet you. Thanks. Uh, it was lovely to be here. Uh, this is actually my first Zoom live that I've it is. attended. And the reason I attended is because I actually read this series as a kid. Yay! Uh, so when I saw that this was being done, I got really excited. Um, I didn't know they did a podcast of the, the second book. And so I this totally took me back to my childhood. So I just want to say thank you uh-huh. um, that you picked this. Well, that's oh, great, amazing. great, Amin. We should just call on you for yeah. anybody questions about. <laughs> I don't want to the... spoil anything. <laughs> want to read the series. How, how was how I'm was big on not spoiling? How was listening to it like in an audio format? Um, how did that differ from your experience in reading it? 
they did an absolutely fantastic job of adapting this into the podcast format yeah. and they've stayed like completely true to the the book i mean it's they did a fantastic job the actors are amazing the sound effects the music it's they just captured the you know the the creepiness like when you're reading this as a little kid too it's kind of scary yeah I can imagine <laughs> um and yeah they just said it's magical it's whimsical it's creepy it was so <laughs> well done so when you were when you were reading it growing up were you reading it uh through braille or through audiobook or both no I actually read it through audio okay. um so they're out I wasn't there. able to get yeah they are out there okay the whole se- I so imagine audiobooks the other audio yeah like the difference between what they're doing a podcast is is that like kind of turn it into an audio drama yeah, right totally. so you're not, it's not nobody's narrating the book it's character driven which is really it cool it sort of reminds me of the bbc adaptation of lord of the rings they did they did that uh way right. back when mm-hmm. as well and that was really well done so yeah. this kind of brings back some of that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Be some bbc I love what you said about the creepiness too, because uh, Simon McBurney, the guy who's playing the narrator, who also directed and adapted this, he, as a kid, he said he read them under the covers, not because he wasn't allowed to. He just said, because it was so eerie, he just felt like he had to read them under the covers, kind of as protection. (laughs) Yeah, totally. I can, I can relate. (laughs) Aww. I imagine it's probably like for, for Simon, it's probably like a, a real full circle moment for him too to be able to revisit a book that was obviously such an impact had such impact on him as a child yeah i think this is this was a a, a real passion project i think yeah very yeah cool. you can tell yeah. thanks Dom, and i hope you join us next week i hope you join us every week but certainly next week definitely <laughs> nice, it's nice to see you hear from you yeah be in space yeah. With you. <laughs> it's a, yeah totally thank you i'm gonna make this a regular habit oh well, we would love that um all right we're gonna do christy next and then we're gonna do sue hi i love that um it was like a storybook um chapter um book and there was music all the way through and i like the jamaican character i thought that was um funny and um is it going to be on your YouTube channel so um, we can watch it at a future date? Um, I, I hope so. We'll, I'll give you the definitive next week, but I hope so. Okay, yeah. Uh, um, because it was um, it was a good part one, and I'm looking forward to uh, part two. Yeah, it's um, it's uh, it's publicly available, so we can share the uh, the links and stuff uh, for people who want to listen to it again. So. Okay. Thank right. you. And that means we can we can host it. <laughs> it really is nice to go back and listen to it again at that I, I find I love listening to these things when I've got you know when you're puttering it's yeah great to yeah 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 and for folks like Louise who couldn't join us tonight who might be wanting to mm-hmm. catch up and I, I think Tony couldn't join us tonight so um all right Sue my friend you're up we'll give Sue a moment to unmute I wonder if they oh. actually. Oh, sorry, uh, you know, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, I was just gonna say. I wonder if they went out in the field and recorded the rooks, or if they had the rooks on a, well, you know, on like a stock sound cart. <laughs> they were a stock rooks. Stock, stock sound. Were, yeah. If they actually went to the place in, uh, uh, I think Berkshire, where they're, you know, supposed to be, whether they actually went, got local rooks. I'm, I'm gonna guess it was stock sound, but I really don't know. I think you're right. Uh, be far easier, wouldn't it? Far easier, far cheaper. Uh, <laughs> all right, Sue, you're up. Am I unmuted? Yeah, we can hear you. Sure. Yep. Okay. There's so many things on on <laughs> settings. Um, I have an answer to what. Amy said about you know how you uh, how you sort of miss something because your mind wanders a little bit. Yes, you got a you got a tip for me. Yes, I do. All right, I've I've been reading fairy tales and things like that my whole life, and the thing I find that you need to do 
is just go along with the character because there's so much you can't understand right. because he can't understand. And people that write, you know, like Harry Potter and everything, mm -hmm. like there's certain, there's certain traditions in magical literature and fairy tales and quests that you're always supposed to feel on edge right. and you're supposed to really suffer with the awful stuff and and feel really creepy and then when you get to the beautiful parts like you know when they hear the beautiful music and like in the lord of the rings and that as well like you feel oh this is beautiful and and to to really appreciate what's happening pretend your will mm -hmm. and drift because he doesn't get it either right that's a fair point i think sue yeah and then um and we're we're meant to be kind of confused and befuddled and entertained and we're they if the writer is successful they will they'll create a a world for you that's as unfamiliar as the character the main character of the story and you're meant to understand it on the second or third read of the book or when you look back at it but we're meant to be kind of fuddled a bit and just sort of wow i don't get this but and you know and they have all the walking in the snow and everything mm -hmm. And I think that's meant to give our our senses a bit of a breather so we can process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what's happened. So I wouldn't worry about trying to follow it. I, <laughs> I think the object is to enjoy it. Yeah, I think that that's that's totally fair. I always had that same that same thing used to happen to me when I would like literally read uh, books mm -hmm. growing up is that sometimes I'd be like, Oh, I have to reread that page again, because for some reason, that doesn't quite equate, but you are absolutely right that sometimes it is the writer's intention, that we kind of just get lost in the story, and it all sort of works its way out. Yes, and it's easier to do this with an audio presentation than it when you're reading because you can whether you're reading with your eyes or with your fingers, yeah. as if braille, you can go up a couple of lines or rewind slightly, yeah. but you're not allowed to with this. So you just kind of, woo, I'm going to get swept along. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's, it's such an interesting point that you, that you make Sue. So when we approach this next week, I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll be, I'll be embracing more of that. I think. Yeah. Cause there's certainly lots of really interesting, like uh, my ears are fascinated. Yeah. Uh, like I'm really enjoying that that journey so I I love hearing all the little the little uh, I, I always wonder too how was it completely and utterly scripted or were like the sisters and brothers were they allowed to have little ad libs in the back all like oh and all that you know with the little the little sort of throwaway yeah. line we call them in the background uh or uh yeah and like how, in from a technical point of view like okay you take a couple steps back off the mics because we want you you know, like you're off in the other room and that kind of thing yeah yeah i mean maybe they maybe the the i don't know maybe they created a little wall of group with those actors to do those throwaway lines i, mean, right. I, I had i i i do know from from doing i wish that cbc still did radio dramas because they were always like actors love doing them because you can show up in your jammies yeah um, but that playing with the props is always really fun, like, you know, with teacups and things like that to make noises. And make noises? Yeah. Yeah. Now I want to make an audio drama. I don't know how to make an audio. I don't know how to make an audio. We I should do, do one make... together. We should do one together. Let's do one together. The Amy yeah, right. and audio drama. All right. Please I'm please. in. I'm in. We'll have to solicit some help from Robert. <laughs> I'll do it too. Wonderful. Yay! I love, I love it. Community, community, community audio drama. I love it. I think I love that idea. I think that'd be great. <laughs> All right. Somebody better start the grant for that. <laughs> well, this has been fun. And I am so looking forward to next week and spending time with folks in next week. <clears throat>
week for the finale and ingrid's going to join us who again as we've mentioned is an uber fan so and of course eileen you're welcome to come back and join us as well but you. Uh, it's nice to have different perspectives on this story because stories impact people each person and on a different level so i'm really excited to hear what ingrid has to say about this series yeah, as well too. but before i officially let you uh go hit the hay um and hopefully don't dream of time travel and <laughs> fighting evil spirits and whatnot but uh, but if you do you know anyways uh we have a prize draw we have a prize draw is all i'm trying to say so would you like to do the prize draw eileen oh i'd love to you'd love to donna i there's donna donna and eileen I, i'm just gonna take it away donna eileen you're an old hat at this you know how to do this i am okay. shaking the names. and i'm just i'm just gonna say a word is that right yeah yep. mm -hmm. old ones Old ones. Oh, we have a new a new person to our space. It's Almond. Ooh, congratulations, Ooh. Almond. You won our prize wow. tonight. Wonderful. So uh Almond, we're gonna connect with you uh via email and we'll uh we'll make sure that we send you a, a raffle prize. That's awesome. Wow, now I definitely have to make sure I'm here every week. Every we week. have a prize every week. <laughs> 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 Gotta have a little fun. Awesome, 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 awesome. All right, friends. Well, that's all for tonight's uh, offering of The Dark is Rising. And uh, we hope that you join us back again next week for part two. Thanks, Eileen, for guiding us through this uh, this BBC. BBC. Body Marie Tall and Left. Mute Thank my you. audio. Thanks for inviting me, Amy. Good night, everyone. Good night. Vocal Eye, vocaleye.ca. Special thanks to our funders, the Canada Council for the Arts, the British Columbia Arts Council, the Province of British Columbia, and the City of Vancouver.